Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features the Uncanny X-Men number 216, cover dated April 1987. So fantastic, stunning cover here by Barry Windsor Smith, featuring two X-Men characters that he had done some stunning issues uh, centering on Storm, of course, in the two parts of Life Death, and Wolverine in Uncanny X-Men 205, the Wounded Wolf um, issue. And here they are uh, on this particular cover with Storm, arm raised, dagger to the fore, and is she going to cut Crimson Commando's throat or not? And this is a scene from inside the comic and it's a key moment in terms of the future direction of this new iteration of the X-Men team that is forming around um, the new giant size X-Men, new uh, core of Wolverine and Storm. Um, so, yeah, just stunning Barry Windsor Smith art here. And it is the last time that he's involved with any of the X books artistically until uh, the Weapon X series um, presented in Marvel Comics Presents, uh, in, coming out in March 1991, issue 72 to 84. So let's open this one up to our splash page. And we do indeed have a splash page here. The title of the story is Crucible. We've got Wolverine here with his, po with his claws popped. Um, and the creative team is Chris Claremont as ever writer, Jackson Geis and Dan Green artist. What that means is that Dan Green is finishing uh, Geis's uh, breakdowns or layouts. Uh, Glynis Oliver colorist, Tom Orzakowski letterer. Um, and there you go. So um, Wolverine, um, in the previous issue, uh, when Aurora and he were investigating the burnt remains of Sarah Gray's um, house in upstate New York, got a familiar scent, scent, the scent of Jean Grey, because X Factor had been at the house in um, X Factor number 12. So he gets Cyclops scent and then he gets Jean Grey's. And of course, as far as Wolverine and uh, the rest of the X-Men are concerned, Jean Grey died uh, by suicide on the moon in Uncanny X-Men 137. So it sent him berserk. Um, and here he is still in a berserk state in the headlights of an oncoming vehicle. So let's turn the page and see what happens. Well, he's hit by this truck and um, the, uh, the, the driver and passenger, uh, there are a couple um, Marcy and Phil, uh, they pull over and um, she's shocked, wondering did she imagine it, but the evidence is on the front of the truck, so there's uh, slash marks like the grill was cut and even the bumper's bent, uh, she notes. So they're uh, stuck on a lonely road in the middle of the Adirondack uh, woods and um, and there's something wild making this roaring noise out in the woods and it's Wolverine. So um, we're told here in the uh, narrative captions, physical injuries are the least of his problems. What drives him careening madly, wildly, mindlessly through the forest is a different kind of pain. With each step, every desperate breath, the man recedes farther and farther into the shadows of his soul and the beast gains ascendancy. It is aware only of a terrible gnawing fear it does not understand and which the rational side of him refuses to face, the loss of his humanity. So he runs, lashing out with blind manic ferocity using his adamantium claws that will cut through anything except his demons within and finally exhausted in body and spirit, he howls. So great page here illustrating all of that and Glenn Oliver's colors really selling that it is nighttime in the Adirondacks. And um, yeah, poor Wolverine, he's had some um, pretty rough um, experiences over the last uh, 12 or so issues of uh, the title. And um, Claremont playing around with the idea that he's losing a grip on his humanity, maybe regressing uh, back to the beast he once was and uh, the feral man he was when he joined the X-Men back in uh, Giant Size X-Men number one. So let's continue. The scene switches to uh, Storm and she is uh, taking care of, so to speak, uh, this uh, teenaged uh, girl who's a drug dealer also. 
and they both of them are prey uh, for a trio of Golden Age World War II superheroes. And Aurora is wondering about um, the whole situation and um, whether she should be um, uh, uh, trying to save um, this character, her name is Priscilla, or not. And so if I continue, yeah, she's thinking that here, but uh, she will return to her old life. Innocence will suffer, perhaps die, and the fault will be partly mine. It is not my place to sit in judgment yet. Have I the right not to? So part of the kind of the thematic of the, of the previous issue and this issue is what kind of direction is this new X-Men team going to take? Because Aurora's fed up with uh, the villains taking the initiative, with the likes of the Marauders catching them, napping, so to speak, and the X-Men um, on the back foot. She wants to take the fight to their enemies. So she wants to uh, make the X-Men a more aggressive team. She's the team leader. Uh, but what's the limit to that? Um, and the trio of uh, Crimson Commando, Super Saber and Stonewall with their willingness to kill um, puts it up to her in terms of what new model uh, there might be uh, for uh, the X-Men team that she's going to lead into the future. And um, uh, Priscilla makes the point that, um, you know, uh, Storm is setting a booby trap here, this fishing wire across the road for Super Saber to behead him. And uh, Priscilla says, uh, you're the one rigging this booby trap. And Storm thinks, true enough, Wolverine would have, would have no qualms about killing the guys that are chasing them. Am I the better or worse for having mine? So this is the Aurora who once upon, upon a time vowed after, um, after acquiescing to the death of the brood embryo that was growing in her in the first brood saga in the X-Men titles, vowed never to kill again uh, with her uh, w working through a moral quandary here. And of course, all of this in the context of the grim and gritty uh, mid to late 80s and uh, the growth of uh, acceptance of superheroes who kill. Um, and there's a lot in common between the attitudes of, uh, the, of uh, Crimson Commando and Punisher in particular um, in this issue. So then we have the business of the set trap and Storm decides not to go through it. So she drops um, her end of uh, the, uh, the wire across the road to let Super Saber pass, which he does. And um, Priscilla is aghast and asks her, whose side are you on anyway? We had that creep cold, we could have nailed him. And Storm responds in Claremontian fashion, my decision, my responsibility. So uh, where to next? So they're gonna go over um, that ridge across the valley by mid-morning, that's Storm's plan. So they set off during the night. And Storm wonders whether she should leave um, Priscilla behind or, um, or not abandon her. And she concludes abandoning her, abandoning her is totally wrong. And we'll see how her trust in Priscilla plays out later in the issue. Now our scene switches to uh, the other side of the Atlantic, Murr Isle here. Um, three days ago though, and the arrival of the X-Men's Blackbird jet, just at sunrise. So here's the sonic boom, and we have our crew aboard, Psylocke, Rogue, uh, Dazzler, Longshot, and Callisto there in the back. And they are bringing to Murr Isle uh, the injured X-Men, uh, Shadowcat, Colossus, and Nightcrawler, as well as the last of the injured Morlocks. They've been um, transporting injured Morlocks after the mutant, after the mutant massacre um, to Murr Isle um, already, and this is the last uh, group to be transported there. So Moore is not too happy with the sonic boom, um, the noisy arrival, and um, Rogue um, apologizes, but also asks Moira to relax and says uh, uh, that she didn't want to take any chances. The idea was to assume the Marauders were waiting for us, um, but there aren't any there, and Psylocke's scan confirmed that. 
And um, Moira asks, where is Storm and Wolverine? And Rogue says, off on their own. Necessary, they said. Told us to stay here till they sent word. Trouble is, we need them as badly with us. There's too much to do, Moira, and no time to do it. And they're the ones we depend on most. Our teachers, our leaders. Without them, we're crippled. So they are the oldest members um, of the current um, version of the team. And Rogue's points are valid ones. So let's continue. Our scene switches back to the Adirondacks, upstate New York. And we have Crimson Commando and Stonewall investigating the trap and uh, the fact that it was um, abandoned and didn't catch Super Saber. And this makes them to um, reconsider uh, their attitude to Storm, or at least Stormwall anyway, Storm, uh, Stonewall, who says, Storm committed no crime, Commando. She isn't like the others we've, we've dealt with. She's involved because of our mistake. But Commando uh, doesn't agree to letting her go because then they'd spend the rest of their lives in jail. Uh, they believe Aurora would um, would give them away to the authorities, set the authorities on them. And uh, Crimson Commando justifies what they do in these terms. We rid society of the crooks, the killers, the rapists, the drug dealing scum who've placed themselves beyond the reach of the law. And we're using a method that strikes terror into those that are left, making it that much easier for the cops to do their job. That's exactly the rationale of Frank Miller's Dark Knight and also the Punisher. So Claremont playing around with that um, possibility for the X-Men into the future, uh, that they might become that more aggressive um, team that Aurora is considering. Then we pick up with Super Saber who returns, but the trap is now taut again. So Stonewall gets in the way and he knocks off Stonewall. <coughs> Excuse me, he's initially surprised, but then it's explained um, how Storm had set a trap, but didn't in fact go through with it. So um, Super Saber sets off to where they think Storm is making towards and he thinks he's got there ahead of her but she's already there waiting because she traveled right through the night and uh, she uh, jumps on top of him and knocks him down into a ravine but here we have the traitor that is uh, Priscilla who uh, pushes a rock over and sets off an avalanche that covers both Super Saber and Storm. And we've got Storm here being noble, basically telling Super Saber to run, but he can't keep his footing or maintain his uh, speed because the slope's too unstable. So they're both apparently covered with rocks. And then we pick up with the stranded couple, Marcy and Phil, and we have Wolverine still feral watching them in the woods. And this is interesting narrative captions here. I see, ears, hear, sense matter more. These beings seem like him, except they are afraid. His body is healed, less so his mind, his sense of self. Then Priscilla emerges <clears throat> from the woods and she makes out that she's glad to see them. Um, obviously, you know, pretending to look for a lift, but she grabs um, Marcy's gun and shoots Phil in the head. And then she pulls the gun on Marcy. And here, this is so subtle. Um, there is just the outline of Blam here um, for the, uh, the, uh, the border of the panel. And that classic Linus Oliver trope of coloring some of the panel in red to indicate um, the violence of the action. And this um, sets Wolverine off and his, uh, he pops his claws there. And um, <clears throat> Priscilla becomes aware that there's something watching in the woods, animal ferocious close by. Uh, the gun sh should stop it, she's afraid of her life. Um, but she gets in the truck and drives off and Wolverine's too late. And then in the narrative captions, we're told at first he simply stares, then comes feeling a sense of wrongness, of failure and shame, then too late, with rational thought, the realization that he might have saved these two and did not. So that's interesting. And then we pick up with um, Stonewall and Super Saber, and not Super Saber, Crimson Commando, arriving on the scene of the uh, collapsed uh, rock face and finding Storm's vest. 
and Super Saber's headgear <clears throat> bloodied. So they're trying to figure out what happened there. Um, someone pushed the mountain down on our buddy and the lady, says Crimson Commando. Um, and they figure out it must have been Priscilla. So they go after her and they're determined um, to uh, deal with her lethally when they find her. And meanwhile, her truck has, the truck has broken down again and um, she's up against um, a tree trunk and then someone grabs her, uh, even as she's waving her gun around. And later on, we find her unconscious. The truck is uh, nosed into, um, um, it looks like a pool or a lake Actually, it turns out to be um, a quicksand bog swamp. And Stonewall arrives, but he's grabbed by uh, Storm, who throws him into the swamp. And then he says here, wait, Storm, this isn't mud I'm in. It's like quicksand. I'm sinking. So she's faced with a moral dilemma once again. Um, so she knows he's not faking. And she knows he would probably let me drown without a second thought. If, if she were in that situation, but she can't do the same. So she pulls him out of the, uh, the quicksand. And uh, she says here, he weighs a ton, or she thinks to herself, and every second I spend with him makes me more vulnerable to the commando, but I will not let him die, especially like this. And she doesn't believe it when she pulls him out. I'm stronger than I look, she says. Step carefully, follow my lead. So, you know, like there's a point, actually it's him who doesn't believe it when she pulls him out, but she says she's stronger than she looks. And there's an interesting couple of things here because um, Claremont has established that mutants are stronger uh, than normal human beings. So that's part of what's going on here. But also, you know, um, at this point, um, Storm is depowered. She doesn't have her powers. And yet, you know, she's an asset, not a liability. To the team and she can handle herself even up against um, this uh, superhero um, who's much larger and stronger than she um, but then we have the traitor here um, who's about to uh, bludgeon storm with a rock and it's curtains for her because crimson commando arrives and throws one of his daggers right into her chest and that's the end of her and next up is Storm, as far as he's concerned, except who arrives on the scene, but a lucid, rational Wolverine. And um, he warns Crimson Commando to reconsider that course of action. So Crimson Commando uh, hurls a knife at Wolverine and the other at Storm. Wolverine deflects the knife with his adamantium claws. Wolverine, uh, sorry, Storm catches the one aimed at her. And um, this is a nice bit here where Wolverine uh, says, um, I don't know these clowns. Want me to take them, boss? Or do we call things quits and everyone goes their separate ways? So he's leaving it up to her. What's her decision? And she says, I wish it was that simple, my friend. So nothing's black and white now for the X-Men um, in this new era. So she decides to take Crimson Commando on single combat, much like she did um, Cal uh, Callisto back in Uncanny X-Men 169. And she does well against him in these six panels. And um, yeah, gets the better of him so that she plucks his own knife uh, from out of his reach, raises it above her, and this is it. Is she going to deliver uh, the coup de grace or what? Interesting ad here for uh, the NAM um, at this era. Excellent art by Michael Golden, of course. I have these issues as well, and perhaps one day I may review them on the channel. Let me know what you think about that in the comments. Would you like to see that? But let's finish off the story, only two pages to go. So Storm decides um, not to kill uh, Crimson Commander, but she says that can quickly change. A twist of my wrist, a slash of this blade across your throat, will do the trick. Your bodies will be cast into the swamp. No one will ever find them. None know what happened. Your fate, Commando, unless the pair of you surrender to the state authorities, confessing fully and completely to your crimes. So basically what happens is um, they decide to go with the second option. Uh, Stonewall makes the point uh, that 
with the law before a jury of our peers, people like us, where we can explain and justify our actions, we have a chance for vindication. So Crimson Commando goes with that option. As he says to Storm, okay, we'll do it your way. Inside, where it counts, where it matters. You're just like us, he says. But Storm retorts, no, tonight I was better. So then uh, Storm and Wolverine back in the car see uh, the um, Crimson Commando and Stonewall uh, handing themselves in to New York State Police. And, um, and then they drive off uh, back down to uh, uh, the X-Mansion, no doubt. And uh, this is what Storm says to Wolverine, that she's tired of waiting for those villains to always make the first move. If the marauders and filth like them desire war, I say further we bring it to their doorstep rather than forever fighting on our own. And Wolverine, though, is not sure he's up for it anymore. And that's because of his, um, uh, his, uh, the beatings he's taken um, in recent um, uh, months or weeks. And also his um, skepticism about uh, whether he can trust his own senses anymore or not. And the, his failure stopping the girl and saving those two kids. And Storm replies, we all have our ghosts, my friend, our secret shames, our guilts. Do we let them rule us? Do we crawl into a hole and hide until our bodies follow our spirits into oblivion? Or do we accept our mistakes and try to learn from them? We are both damaged goods, she says. That is part of what makes us human. And Wolverine asks her, have you considered the ramifications of all of this? These hunters rationalized what they did behind the noblest of reasons. We're on that same road storm cruising along that same abyss we got lucky last night don't count on it ever again if we live and those and fight by those hunters rules how do we keep from becoming like them aurora you told the commando you were better how do we stay that way so this is the moral conundrum facing the core of the team going forward and which direction they're going to go but they end up going to the outback in Australia and hitting their enemies uh, hard, fast and covertly. So that is the direction things are going um, over the next uh, couple of years on the title. So um, I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Uncanny X-Men 216. If you did, please like the video on YouTube. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.